Well, I'm going to dig on a couple of things, not on the list necessarily. I'm going to... Oh. <laughs> um, what what's this is there's a it's an impossible question of course because I'm on a bit of a roll but your what are your ideal athlete qualities you've now got the magic wand and you're picking your your team whatever environment what are the qualities that that would stand out for you in those those players players have to be competitive and that's actually a really underrated uh, an underrated quality for players we we tend to make the assumption that um, that players are when they once they reach a certain level they must be super competitive, but it's not true. There's a in like in any other environment there's a big range of uh, of qualities and uh, just because people reach a high level doesn't mean they're competitive. And if for, to be completely to be completely straight about it, I've never met anybody as competitive as the those that first group of guys who hit balls at me in the spike warmer. So I ended up playing years later. I ended up spending a lot of time with those guys and playing with them, and they were the most competitive group of people that I've come across in 40 years, counting Olympic medalists and and so on. So. Competitiveness is a really big quality. Um, the willingness to the willingness to make decisions is a really big quality. Um, a lot of and and accept the consequences of those decisions, uh, and that's probably this I I think is the single most important thing that the best players in the world have, is that they will make decisions and accept whatever the consequences of they are uh, that they are. It, it's something if you look at uh, someone like Enger Pet, someone like Bruno, these these guys, they are not afraid. It's not that they are better skilled. It's not that they are, have better technique or are faster or stronger. It's that they're more able and more willing to live with the consequences of their actions. And those are probably the two qualities that uh, that I'm looking at that I'm interested in. Wow, that's awesome. Um, and I, I go uh, I'll, 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 on the same point. I'll turn it around a little bit, and the the players that are the most difficult to work with are not the crazy emotional guys. They're the guys who don't want to play and don't want to practice, who don't want to compete, because somebody who's a lunatic in inverted commas, but who really wants to play, you can always find a way to guide them more or less in the right direction. But somebody who doesn't want to play, you can never make them play. It, there's nothing that you can do to make them play. Cool. What about coaching Even size? They, you're obviously super competitive. Uh, as a person, you've been brought up in that environment. Is that something, a characteristic that the coach needs to show, demonstrate? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's in your bloods and your family. Your, your brother's the same. Um, um, this is a that's actually a really interesting point. Um, I think I think that coaches are a lot of the time coaches are the most competitive people. So. Uh, most coaches that I know are, pro, are more competitive than most players. So if you want to, you know, if you want to make that, there's an overlap, of course. But um, so coaches are coaches are super competitive because it's also how they how they get to to be coaches is you know this is a really small group of them. Um, I don't players aren't interested in a lot of the most of the time they're not interested in the coach and his qualities and the things that he thinks and and whatever so um if you tell the players you know how competitive and how important it is for you to win and blah blah they're just not interested in that kind of thing so what you have to what the coach has to do is actually to 
guide the players in that way, in that direction, but without telling them because you know, the the fastest way to to get a player to um, uh, to stop listening to you is to tell a story about when you were a player. <laughs> Yeah, especially hear. me because I didn't, I, I wasn't at a really high level. But there's lots of stories of uh, um, uh, in New Zealand, I can say this, or in Australia, like a guy like Bernardi, who was a great player, who um, who would, in the beginning of his coaching career at least, who would say, you know, when I was a player, and even if he was the best player in the history of the game, which a lot of people think that he was. The players, even ten years later, are just not interested. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Um, tell us the Aussie senior men, the Olympic cycle. You took over as national coach, trying to qualify or in the run into Tokyo. Um, yeah, it was a yeah. From from the start, you went in. What did you look to do? Uh, what were the what were parts of the bumpy road that you had to solve, or the team had to solve through that path, and then you you come down to the you get to the end, and it's pretty tight, pretty close, pretty tight. Tell us tell us your your take on it. Like uh... when I when I started working with the team in 2017, it was a a pretty low point in the team, in the the history of the team. So uh, I think the the previous five or six years none of them were very positive times uh but the that end of 2016 period was a was a particular low point uh players were not uh players didn't feel valued or engaged and uh and the first the first interactions i had with them were sort of uh were were ambivalent about if they want to continue playing or not. In a lot of cases, I mean, there are some guys who always play and whatever, but there was a lot of ambivalence towards the team and, and participation in the team. My very first, uh, my very first goal, my m most important working point, um, the whole time really, but uh, particularly at the beginning was to create an environment that the that first and foremost the players the players wanted to be a part of, so that they would go, uh, they amongst themselves they would say I, I love playing I love being in the national team that they would go out and say I love being in the national team to other people that they would go home to their clubs and say the national team is is what I is what I want to do and what you should be doing, and that was. Um, was fairly explicit in in everything that I, I did from the beginning. Um, the and we ended up that ended up being a project over uh, over a period of years um, that was also uh, to creating creating an identity creating um, that idea and we ended up calling the the volley ruse the volley ruse way was was a central part of that. Uh, we had some. Uh, we didn't have. We had some guys who didn't participate after 2016. So we had a lot of uh, newer players coming in, and we uh, and we lost a lot of quality uh, around that around that period. Um, so we lost uh, Zingle, we lost White, we lost Geimer, we lost. Um, Edgar, for all intents and purposes, um, and but it, in a couple of different positions, we we were really um, well, not not a high quality. So then it's about building a way of playing, which is the thing that I do anyway, uh, so that we can uh, and and the mentality of playing, way of playing, mentality of playing to be able to. Uh, compete at uh, at high levels, higher level than we theoretically should be able to compete, and that's the those two things hand in hand were uh, the work as we as we went on 17, 18, uh, 2019. 
was then with a with an Olympic uh, kind of focus at the end, uh, but continuing on the with the same the same ideas, the same ideals on the basis that if we can do those two things, then we'll put ourselves in the best position to uh, to qualify at the end. At the end, comes down to one tournament, um, and you know, I, I, obviously this is <laughs> not the first time I've thought about this, but you know, there's not really any other answers other than everybody had one collective bad day. We had a massive brain fart. I don't know. I don't really can't think of any other better way to describe it. Uh, we lost one game that ended up being the the critical game and and we didn't get a chance to go on in the tournament. There's no guarantee, of course, had we won that game that we would have uh, that we would have won, but um, that's that. and and the nature of the beast is whatever when you're in a performance environment, it's at some point it's going to come down to one game and um, life's not fair. Mike. Tough question on the back of that. Oh, you got to it gets tougher. Yeah. yeah, you get to replay it. What would you change in that process, if anything at all? How far can I go back to change things? As far as you want. My hindsight's wonderful, and I suppose that's where the learnings are. And, and you know, so... Mark Leverdue comes around in a cycle and there's a great group of athletes in the 2022-23 squad and you go, actually, I want to I I be part of that because we could take them to the 2028 Olympics. And so what would you, what, um, what are some of the things that change in this process going into that? There are probably two, the two things that uh, that I look back on that were uh maybe key maybe key moments uh maybe two or three uh two key two key decisions i guess uh one was the the world cup um and uh there are some things in world cup that uh probably that uh in the the approach and the way that we went through that tournament that uh that didn't help um when we you know that the world cup and the qualification weren't connected but you know they you know they they're still connected even if they weren't one week after the other so there were definitely a couple of things there that didn't help um and there were there was a couple of team selection things along the way that I would have handled that I would have handled differently. Um, maybe not, maybe not the actual selections, but some things around the way selections were done and, um, and some things there. Uh, and there's a bunch of things about the actual last game that we played, um, that are sort of micro things, but that's the, um, I the micro the things review. that's what we want to hear, like, you know. The micro oh, things. Uh, yeah, the micro things, what, you know. Like, like. Um, the, 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 my, the, we played at 10 o'clock in the morning um, and uh, we didn't have a good enough plan for playing at 10 o'clock in the morning. So that was the, that was the main one. You know what what our our program and schedule would be that morning. Um, that's the that's the main one. Uh, and yeah, so I mean, what time we when we did the video meeting, what time we woke up, what what our activity was before the game. Um, you know, so all of those all of those things in the game is probably. Maybe one thing that I that I might have done differently, except I probably wouldn't have done it differently because that that's a there's a hindsight one. So basically, the uh, there's no reason I can't tell the story. 
is that we with this team um, the what what I worked out over time was that uh, as a as a group as a team the thing that they needed from me for their best performance was for me to be calm and for me to um, give some solutions but to always you know to to not be emotional to be okay guys we just keep plugging keep plugging keep plugging and in the end we'll win and this worked really well at asians and it got us through some uh some really difficult moments at asian championships where we you know, some five setters that we played some really like hairy moments where the guys were um you know the, when they were really stressed out and i kept and i kept it together and uh you know we worked it out in the end kind of something along those lines that was a that was a deliberate decision and the best way for that for the that team to play together when we got to that last game we we started really slowly and then and there was a moment where i wanted to fire it up a little bit and i i sort of semi fired it up and didn't seem to get a an, uh, an instant response so I went back to being to the calm version that had worked really well before and in hindsight probably the I needed to actually go off the rails a little bit in that moment so and there was one sub that maybe that maybe could have made a small difference in the third set but that's uh, that's life so Tapering down, that's, that's a couple of things. And if I looked at a daily preparation in your pro teams or in the national team, what is it? What is a day? What is what is prep like? So maybe if you're playing on a sad day and the last training's when, and then getting into the day, what does it look like from a coach's perspective? And I suppose what you expect your players to do in that time. Just a quick rundown. Uh, the so in general i don't uh i don't practice twice a day so in the pro teams as well uh we do i do one session in the afternoon that's my uh that's my basic way we do a lot of six against six because we're looking at we're trying to um uh, identify game situations and have uh, group responses so uh, that's the way that we we practice the last the the day before a game um, will be there'll be a video meeting a video preparation meeting before the match. Um, I my rule is that uh, video meetings never go longer than thirty minutes, or any meetings don't don't go longer than thirty minutes. Uh, and in teams where there's a fine system in place for being late or uh, wearing the wrong shirt or pair of socks or whatever. Uh, I normally put in there that if a meeting goes goes too long, then I actually have to pay a fine to the team. So it'll be a because um, you know the coach has to be accountable in the same way that the players. The coach is not above the players, just has a different position. Uh, so we'll have the video meeting before practice. Uh, practice on the last day will be uh maybe an hour 15 depending on if how we've traveled if we've traveled or not before but uh but tends to be hour 15 it won't be competitive i don't normally compete the day before uh it'll be again a lot of six against six uh, probably some side out uh focus the day before the game the last practice before the game is the only time in the week that i'll practice with the starters together uh, otherwise, I change the I change teams for uh, for every game, for every set, um, and with some particular goals in mind. But the day before the game is the only day that I'll practice with the starters together. Uh, and one thing that I've learned um, over the years is that different is the players like to have like to do different things the day before a game. Um, some guys like to go really hard. Some guys like to do extra serves, extra receptions, extra this. Uh, some guys want to be uh, as 
uh, have as little fatigue as possible going into the game. So uh, the one the way to do everything is to spend a lot of time is to spend a lot of time, but then um, you know if you to get in all the extra reps of this and that, and you have a, a two and a half hour training, which means that half of the guys who don't want to go too hard uh, ended up going too hard. So what I'll do is a uh, uh, is the hour 15, but we have the court for another 45 minutes, typically where the players can do whatever individual work they want to do um, before the game. And this is really this is really effective because then they do exactly what they want to do, exactly as much as they want to do in the exact format they want to do it. Uh, and you know, coaches serve balls, toss balls, throw balls, um, you know, and everybody gets the thing that they need need or want or think they need or want to think that they have before the game. Uh, so that's the day before the game. The day of the game, this we have a second video in the normally in the morning. Uh, there'll be an hour practice in the morning until now, although I'm rethinking about that for for the future, uh, which will be uh, that morning practice. I like I like that, or my goal is that everybody does uh, maybe 10 maximal actions. So five or six serves, five or six attacks that are, that are close to their maximum, close to their maximum attention. Uh, and then, you know, a few minutes at the end for the, the extra six service reps and or reception reps or whatever, and then uh, we go for the game. Uh, mental prep? Uh, it's all mental prep. Yeah. And do you have to jockey that at all? Like, is it the players? Are, I mean, you're in an environment where you'd expect the players to be pretty focused all the time, but I presume it's not always the case. So, um, how do you check in with one, the and that? One one thing, one characteristic of my practice is that uh, I don't practice for a long time. Um, so I don't have really long sessions, like two and a half hour sessions or three hour sessions that a lot of coaches have. So my players never, not never, but rarely get to the to a point of fatigue where they're, they're not, they don't want to go to practice or... Um, you know, the the length of time that you're together is actually important for uh, fatigue and team building and team stress and all of those things. So um, I, I'm constantly checking in with guys about how they respond to different situations, different training environments, different training stresses. But um, my overall volume is is um definitely at the low end of the spectrum and i never really have problem with uh, in that area with with guys who are um you know have tro to training stress or so some kind of psychological stress related to that nice just sharing last, last two things where do you see the sport of volleyball in five years time what does it look like Good question. Um, I think that I I think there'll be more variation. Um, I think we've we've hit the kind of peak of uh, specialization, you know, in a sense. And I think that the the thing that we'll we'll see and we're seeing right now is that there are there's more uh, individual variety in the game. So uh, there's a lot more, so serving, uh, there's a lot more inbuilt variety in serving right now, different, different positions, different types. Um, that's a big part of the game. Uh, there's a lot of different attack situ uh, solutions that are used now, how players tip, how players use the block. Um, we see we see that a lot, and that's sort of been going on for the last three or four years, um, and that will continue. And I think 
once that gets to a point, coaches will look at some ways that they can um, have some variation in their systems. So right now everybody plays more or less the same way and we have individual variations. I think once the individual variations sort of plateau, coaches will look at some ways they can change things. Um, I think I, I have a suspicion that there can be a, a rule change um, about uh, in about attack uh, and particularly the uh, the way that people uh, can tip. Um, maybe not a rule change, but definitely an interpretation, and that'll change the that'll change the game again. Um, but I think what we'll see is um, as a more more athletic, more uh, dynamic, and with some uh, some more individual variation. Ask, asking great questions, but you haven't mastered the mic yet. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't got many left for you, to be honest. I think we've got, got everything we needed to get through. Um, if you are coming into New Zealand volleyball, for some reason you wanted to live in the golden sands of Mount Maunganui, and you went, right, what's what's realistic for New Zealand? Um, and we wanted to give instruction and support to athletes to maybe you know, get more professional athletes playing. Um, what what will we what will we try and do with our athletes? You know, what what will we you know, as a system uh, get everyone on the same page? What what sort of things would you focus on in our part of the world to improve our game? For me, get more players overseas playing somewhere, which would by default make us better. What stuff we need to really you just if you trimmed everything back, what what would be a couple of priorities? You'd say do this and do this, and they have to happen. It's really, really difficult for me to to answer that question well because, to be honest, I don't know the first thing about New Zealand volleyball as it is right now. Um, but the the way to get better is to have better players. It's it's really we can we can spend money on on coaching and we can have the best philosophy and and you know all the money in the world, but uh, you actually need to have some pretty good players to to improve the standard. Um, so that's the first thing is to is to go and find a bunch of big guys, big girls, and uh, and get them playing volleyball, and then moving from there. And if I wanted to turn this back to Australia, is that's a thing that that uh, Australia did really well for one period sort of from the, say, the mid-90s to the mid-2000s uh, and has not done as well uh, since then, which is, you know, which we can see in the in the guys that are in the team and um, and perhaps uh, the, overall, the overall level. So um, get out, uh, inspire coaches to get out into schools to find big kids to inspire and uh, that's the it's probably the only way anyway nice probably, and, uh, probably not really. oh, <laughs> definitely a big person's game unfortunately at the very top level the last thing how do people follow you mate you've you've got a pretty pretty cool blog i believe just uh i mean you definitely spend a lot of time writing um, you believe i mean i thought you i thought you read it every day yeah, uh, every, I second day, every second day. It's on Facebook. Uh, At home on the court. There's a couple of things that that I do and involve with. Uh, I write a blog called uh, At Home on the Court, which is uh, marklebedu.com. Um, sure, I'm sure you'll write it in the in the notes. Um, there's also a Facebook page and a Twitter account um, with the with the same thing. Uh, with the where I just share whatever ideas I have and and uh, other interesting things, um, well, interesting to me. <laughs> uh, the I'm also involved with a project called the Volleyball Coaching Wizards, uh, which is volleyballcoachingwizards.com. Uh, it's a bunch of uh, uh, interviews with with. Uh, 
high level coaches or quality coaches because it's not only about professionals there's coaches from uh from different different levels from high school level to uh pro men pro women beach volleyball um and there's their long form interviews there's a uh, two books that come out of that project one is a collection of the interview transcripts and one is a discussion on uh, some of the key themes that that have come up through the interviews i think there's there's 35 interviews or something uh in the in the series um and those that's where you can track down um thoughts i thoughts i have and things that i've been involved with nice and, and just to finish three books that you'd recommend every coach to read whoa three books for every yeah. coach um i've been asked this a lot the uh, the first the first book, my favourite coaching book, is still uh, Sacred Hoops by Phil Jackson. Uh, it's kind of kind of topical right now with the with the Jordan stuff coming out, but um, it's a it's just a great read. It's a great way of thinking thinking about things. Um, the other one that uh, is less well known is uh, one that I think a lot of people can uh, can get a lot out of is a book called um, Ajax Barcelona Cruyff, which oh. is uh, a, a collection of interviews with Johan Cruyff over the over 20 odd years from his playing career through his uh, through his coaching career, um, where he explains a lot of his ideas or a lot of his ideas come out, which are uh, amazingly interesting. And the third one, let me remind myself. Um, for now, I'll say I'll say anything about John Wooden, oh, nice. the the basketball, the American basketball coach. Yeah. Superb. Well, Mark Liberty, thank you for your time. Really appreciate your comments, and uh, definitely think you'll have stirred up some thoughts with a few people. Um, and hopefully, uh, that's. That's my goal. That's the goal of my all of my interactions with the outside world. Uh, really, I I want people to uh, to think about what they're doing, to think about volleyball, to think about ways to to be better. Um, and if I if I have been able to do that in the last hour and nineteen minutes, then uh, then my work here is done. Awesome, Mark Liberdew, appreciate it, and Wally New Zealand, appreciate it it's a lot, and uh, hopefully we keep in touch, and Dave keeps in touch with you, just in case you come down under again, and we can tie it in for a, a fleeting visit to the lovely Aotearoa, so thank you very much, appreciate it, and uh, be well in these chat. interesting times, and we'll thank you. Follow, you, uh, follow you and your success if the season starts this, uh, this season coming up. All right, Thanks, beautiful. Mate. Thanks, Uri.